Yeah, the moon people definitely were overcome by our invasion of the moon in 1969. Now, according to President Trump, and the Martians do not want this. We have set up many meetings with the Martians, uh, and I can tell you that the Mars will not be invaded like they were on the moon. They even, we even invited them to join us in Congress to make, you know, give us a, a point of what they want. We tried offering peace, you know, initiatives, but they just turned that down as well. According to the highly documented Topps peanut, uh, uh, Topps bubblegum, the Martian wars were well documented by uh, this company. And uh, for those of you who remember in the 1960s, actually 1962, I remember these cards when they were on sale uh, in the uh, in the stores. In fact, my favorite is number 19. I had dreams about that one. Anyway, uh, at this point, uh, some other sections of uh, allies joined Mars in uh, basically bringing uh, uh, war to the Earth. A lot of uh, movies were made about Martian invaders. Even in the 1930s, we had Flash Gordon riding his ships against Mars. In time, other planetary uh, species joined the war uh, against Earth. Here, a ranking member of the Scandibahuvian prelate reads from their book of, of, of uh, showing their respect of our species, only to find out that it was a ruse. Finally, the esteemed Martian general made his intentions clear. And this only, this is just an extension of what Mars has always been. Mars has always been the god of war. And in fact, all the probes that we have sent to Mars, more than half were destroyed before reaching there. And as you can see, only the United States managed to get their probes to the surface of Mars. Now, why is that? What could possibly have turned Mars to accept the United States and no one else? We all know what we must do. We must learn about our enemy. We must learn about what makes Mars, you know, our our foremost foe as far as planets are concerned. First of all, the motion of Mars is extremely difficult to explain. It seems to go in circles around the sky. It doesn't move across the sky normally. It actually goes through retrograde motion. Every year, it goes backwards for several months, only to go forward. The mathematicians were totally confounded by this weird movement. It, it, to, trying to explain this motion, Aristotle actually put astronomy studies back almost a thousand years trying to explain this. In the 1600s, uh, two astronomers, Tycho Brahe, Johann Kepler, try to make sense 
of how Mars moved in the sky. Tycho had everything going in very good circles around the Earth. Meanwhile, Kepler had everything going around the sun. After years and years of work, Kepler's or Mars orbit was still eight arc minutes off. That's about a quarter of the size of the, of the full moon in the sky. But Kepler kept on researching the, uh, the possibilities of what made Mars so weird. And what he found out was actually what was called his first law of planetary motion. The fact of the matter is that Mars moved in an ellipse rather than a circle. As soon as he made all of the planets move in ellipses around the sun, everything worked. So now we know that the planets move in ellipses around the sun. And now we can predict right down to the last foot where a planet is going to be even 20 years from now. So that was Kepler's major breakthrough, the fact that they moved in an ellipse. With the invention of the telescopes, uh, Mars actually gave us a real good view of a planet that actually changed over the course of its year. We actually saw seasons on this planet. We saw the polar caps rise and fall, actually get larger and smaller over time. I remember watching Mars through a telescope and seeing how it changed over a period of a year. In the late 1800s, uh, astronomers using telescopes thought they saw an awful lot more going on on Mars than what was reality. An Italian astronomer by the name of Schiaparelli uh, saw channels on Mars. And in his uh, translation of uh, Italian to English, channels was actually translated into canals. Now, Schiaparelli's uh, uh, pictures uh, show these straight lines, which were considered to be, uh, well, again, channels or even canals on the surface of Mars. Uh, an astronomer by the name of Percival Lowell took these as real and made his maps showing Mars as a industrial uh, giant, actually uh, extending these canals from the poles down to the central regions. It was believed that the Martians were building these great canals uh, as a way of keeping the planet, which was thought to be dry, keeping the planet uh, uh, hydrated so they can you have huge gardens, which they can actually watch change, watch them change over a period of a year. Uh, according to the New York Times in 1911, the Martians built two huge canals, which helped them get water from the poles to the central regions of Mars. At this point, the Martian surface was considered to be a, 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 a threshold of all of the giant cities, and books were written about it. Uh, People considered to be considered Mars to be well inhabited and possibly even technically advanced, or possibly even more advanced than the Earth. Uh, movies were made about the advancement of Mars. Uh, some of these movies were quite scary, like Invasion, Invaders from Mars. That one kept me up at night. Of course, then again, there's Mars Attacks, which kept me up with laughter, actually. Uh, some of them were pretty strange. 
and uh, involves some strange stuff going on. One of the books that was written in the early 1950s, which I happened to own at the time, was this book, Exploring Mars, by Roy Gallant. And he actually used the maps that were created uh, about 70 years before as real, uh, showing how Mars uh, is probably an inhabited world. On the left side, you see uh, the pictures of Mars taken of approximately the same area. And I have trouble seeing those canals that were depicted in the, in the pictures. Now, the best opportunity to visit Mars happens about every two years. That's because that's when the Earth and Mars are at their closest point together. And the best way to show this is to show how Mars and the Earth go around the sun, showing how Mars and Earth actually are closer together every two years. So as you can see, the race is on, the Earth is pulling ahead here, and, and they, when they meet, that's one of their places where the line between the two planets is at its shortest. And you can see two years later, there it is again. So about every two years would be the best time to visit Mars. So to take a look at this, we would send something off just at its point of closest uh, conjunction and the Mars probe would catch up to Mars and get caught by its gravitational pull. But that hasn't stopped the invaders uh, from Mars to actually hover around the Earth and get spotted as UFOs uh, throughout time. Kind of looks like the one that landed in Roswell, doesn't it? Anyway, of all the probes that we have sent up there, half, actually more than half, have been destroyed or shot down or never made it. Yet the US probes, almost all of the US probes have made it there. So we're gonna take a look at some of those, uh, some of the things that those US probes have uh, taken pictures of and we'll learn a little bit more about Mars. For one thing, the first one that went out there was Mariner 4. <clears throat> now, what's interesting about this is the image, uh, the, the, the image that Mariner 4 took. It actually used film. And then aboard that probe, there was a, uh, a, a film developing station where it developed the film and then it ran the film in front of a fax, which transmitted that, uh, that image to the earth. So we actually had film made into a fax, which was transmitted to the earth and then stored. And using those pictures, they've actually had a number of rehash of those uh, pictures and uh, we, they've gotten better over the years. <clears throat> What's interesting about this is the fact that when, they, when this came out on July 15th, 1965, that was actually the day before I applied for my first astronomy related job. And when I went into that job interview, <clears throat> I was very destroyed over the fact that I saw craters on Mars. I mean, I was almost crying over the fact that there was nothing living on that planet, as far as I knew. But I got the job anyway. Anyway, uh, let's keep on moving here. Uh, one of the things that was found out on Mars was the fact that Mars has global wide dust storms and these would last for weeks upon end. And one of the things that happened 
was as Mariner 4 got to Mars, there was actually a dust storm raging and they actually had to wait for the dust storm to subside before taking pictures. And this raised even more doubts about the possibility of life on Mars. One of the things that's easily seen uh, through any kind of a probe is this thing, Olympus Mons. This is possibly the largest volcano in the solar system. It's, uh, it, it's more than 300 miles wide and it's about 50 miles tall. Just absolutely huge. As you can see, it's um, you know, 27 kilometers tall. So, you know, that's, that's abs absolutely huge. And why, how, how can a volcano, for what we know about volcanoes, how could that volcano possibly be that large? And one of the theories actually started off as a theory, and now it's been proven, is the fact that uh, unlike the volcanoes on the Earth, uh, Olympus Mons is a volcano that keeps on growing. On the Earth, we have the plate tectonics where our crust is constantly moving. Uh, so we have uh, volcanoes will form and then the crust will move uh, over the lava bed and then will form another volcano. On Mars, there are no plate tectonics. As a result, the volcano will simply get higher and higher and higher. This actually might be a good thing, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. With all the data that has been sent back, they found that Mars has some secrets that uh, have only recently been deciphered. And the way to learn about those secrets is to send probes there. The first probe that made it out there was actually Mars 2. Mars 2 was sent out there by the Soviet Union. It landed on Mars and immediately took a picture. Unfortunately, that, that's what the picture looks like. We have no idea what that picture is or what it was trying to take a picture of. Uh, we think that the white area might be the surface, but as you can see, there's an awful lot of static on there. However, the Mars orbiters, which have been circling Mars for about the last 20 years, have been able to locate the Mars 2 probe, and they found that it's sitting on its side. Uh, they found it's uh, uh, its uh, parachute and the heat shield and not a whole lot else. They have found that the Martian poles actually have frozen carbon dioxide on it. That's dry ice. And that dry ice is uh, it's pretty much perpetual. It's always there. The rest of Mars actually has water ice, and that's been found under the surface of the soil on Mars. Now they keep on saving all this data, and what they have found is as they re-examine re this data, they get more and more information about it. One of the last probes sent out there was MAVEN, who actually looked at the atmosphere and how the atmosphere may have evolved over time. And it found out some interesting things about the Martian atmosphere. For one thing, the Martian atmosphere is evaporating away from the surface. 
and it's been evaporating for possibly billions of years. So this atmosphere is being pushed away by the solar wind. Here on the Earth, we have a very, very nice, neat aurora, which has been, well, it's, it's shaped by our magnetic field. On Mars, its magnetic field, its aurora, is somewhat in disarray. It doesn't seem to have any pattern to it at all. And if we take a look at Mars, uh, some of this will actually tell us why. First of all, Mars has about one-tenth the mass of the Earth. As a result, its gravity isn't that much. We would, we would experience almost two-thirds less gravity. If we weighed 100 pounds on the Earth, we would pay, pay, uh, weigh only 38 pounds on Mars. It would take the volume of six Mars in order to fill up the volume of the Earth. The Martian distance from the sun is not, well, it's about one and a half times that of the Earth. And it takes almost twice as long for a year to pass or once around the sun than the Earth does. It takes 365 Earth days for us to go around the sun well, it takes 687 Earth days for Mars to go around the sun. And that's a pretty important thing. The atmosphere is one hundredth that of the Earth. So as a result, it's extremely thin on the Martian surface. And almost all of the Martian atmosphere is made up of carbon dioxide. So we would have a real tough time breathing on that planet. If you can split the uh, planet, uh, you would find that the inside of the Earth is, uh, has a solid iron core. And we're not sure about Mars, but we're learning the last thing that we sent to Mars the InSight uh, Mars probe, which just landed on Mars, uh, we're going to learn more about the core of that planet. What's interesting about this is the fact that Mars does rotate very similarly to the Earth. Here on the Earth, we make one rotation in 23 hours. 56 minutes. On Mars, that's about, oh, about 24 and a half hours, almost 25 hours. What makes it so interesting is the fact that we have an internal clock in us. It's called our circadian rhythm. And we have found that our circadian rhythm is more attuned to a Martian day than it is to an Earth day. As a result, there are a lot of people who believe that humanity probably came from Mars. I'm not quite sure, well, not anyway. So we have sent a lot of probes to Mars according to the Viking probe, which landed on Mars, its orbiter found a face on Mars. And immediately, NASA said, that's not possible. There's no way that's a face on Mars. So they took a lot of pictures of that particular thing, and they looked at it at different angles, and they said it's just the contrast of a particular a uh, uh, hill on Mars, uh, looking at different uh, low sun angles and stuff. So there's no way that's actually a face on Mars. 
of course, trying to convince people who believe that we actually came from Mars. That's an awful hard thing to convince people of. However, they did point out that this gully seems to have filled with water over a period of time. Further pictures have shown that the Martian surface does get hit by meteorites, which brings up a question. Here on the Earth, when a meteor hits the Earth, it's called a meteorite. What would it be called if a meteor hit the surface of Mars? Would it still be called a meteorite? Maybe a meteor won't. Well, I don't know, but keep on going here. Uh, we also found a happy face on Mars. So we also found what appears to be an armadillo uh, uh, poking itself into the surface of Mars. And we'll talk more about some of these anomalies a little bit later on. Anyway, um, one of the, the first probe, the first, shall we say, active probe to actually land on Mars and do some work was the Viking uh, spacecrafts. Uh, these were uh, under the direction of, uh, wow, that just went bananas, Carl Sagan. Uh, Carl Sagan uh, believed that uh, we should investigate Mars a lot more. Uh, they, we, we would have liked to have sent Carl with it, but uh, he didn't quite fit in there. But so the Viking spacecrafts uh, landed on Mars in 1976 and took some pictures around there, actually had a little scoop, we scooped up some soil and put it into an analyzer. What they were looking for was some kind of, let's say, carbon gas that would indicate some type of metabolism. So in other words, they were looking for something that would eat the nutrient injection. Uh, sometimes it was called chicken soup. It would eat the chicken soup and then give off uh, carbon gas as a waste product. You know, good enough thinking there. And they did that and they found that suddenly it was releasing lots and lots of carbon gas. And they said, by God, we found all sorts of life on that planet. And then they immediately saw the graph take a dive. And they said, oh my God, we killed it. So they, had, they added a second injection of chicken soup into that. And they found that the curve suddenly went back up again. So there was definitely, according to this particular experiment, life on Mars. Well, then the scientists started thinking, well, maybe it was just a chemical reaction. Maybe it was just reacting with the chicken soup, but not as a life form. So they all moved away uh, saying that there's life on Mars. So more probes were sent to Mars. And some of the landings that they made were kind of weird. They actually had a spacecraft that was inside a whole bunch of, of spheres that would cushion the landing on Mars. I don't know, when I think of this, I think of this. So I'm not quite sure what they were thinking of, but, in, but luckily uh, the thing landed on Mars in one piece and this was the Sojourner, which actually took pictures on Mars and also kind of scooted around. Uh, it was about the size of a shoebox and it took some pictures. Meanwhile, the orbiter that went around Mars took pictures of the surface and it took it in varying levels of three dimension. So we have the black and white, then we start adding more color to it and more grains 
a, a gray scale to it, and we find that we have a lot of different features on the planet. Well, this was the first of the pollution that we have put on Mars. No wonder the Martians don't like us. So we put lots of interesting uh, pollution on Mars. Here is the uh, first rover that we put on there. We have the, you can see some rover tracks on the top. We have the landing rocket blast, which probably destroyed something that was built by the Martians. We have the heat shield over there. And you can see that before we put the stuff on there, it was a nice pristine plane. So this was definitely uh, not a great thing that we did on Mars, but we learned a great deal from it. We put actually three sizes of rovers on the planet. And each of those rovers uh, actually made tracks, as you can see, and started looking around the surface. So we've landed actually nine different spacecraft on the surface of Mars. We have uh, Mars 3, Viking 1, Viking 2, Sojourner, Spirit, Opportunity, uh, Phoenix, Curiosity, and Insight. And all those are on Mars. Actually, right now, only Phoenix, I, I think Phoenix has, job, has died also. So right now, all we have is curiosity and insight actively giving us information about the surface, about the, the Martian surface. Opportunity has the record of driving distances on Mars. It's actually gone about uh, 32 miles on the surface of Mars. Curiosity is still going on, and well, I don't know how far it will go. Unfortunately, Spirit only lasted about six years and only went about four miles, five miles. So, uh, interesting thing, we have uh, the uh, opportunity in Spirit uh, actually landing on the surface of Mars, as you can see from the, this was actually an exhibit. And we have lots of different things. You can see the whole solar array on top, uh, giving the, the, uh, the probe power. Uh, as long as it had sunlight, it would keep on operating. Uh, what they didn't count on was the fact that Mars is a very dusty, place. And the uh, spirit and opportunity did not have a little green man associated with it to be able to dust off all of the uh, collection that uh, actually covered the solar array. Whenever there was a, a, a storm on the planet, uh, the scientists were happy to get the dust blown off because suddenly they would see a surge in power and the batteries would recharge. What's interesting is the fact that the uh, Spirit and Opportunity were designed to last only 90 days on the planet. Spirit actually lasted six years and it finally died when one of the wheels was actually broken and for a year or two, in order to move around, Spirit actually had to travel backwards, dragging its broken wheel behind it. It finally got stuck in a, um, in, in a, uh, uh, sand, uh, uh, <coughs> a sand ditch and it, it couldn't move and finally died because uh, it turned into uh, dark, actually it turned into winter and the sun wasn't bright enough 
to keep the solar cells operating. Meanwhile, Opportunity, uh, it did manage to find lots of uh, dust devils on the surface, and they actually hoped that these dust devils would blow off some of the uh, dust that was on the surface of these solar arrays. Uh, here you have uh, the, um, the tracks that Spirit or Opportunity actually made in the soil of Mars. Let me see something here. Okay, one of the things that was very important was the fact that it takes time for light or information or um, any kind of direction from the Earth in order to get to, Mar uh, to get to Mars. This the speediest it would take is three minutes, two seconds. Unfortunately, that would be at its closest approach. At its furthest approach, it would take 22 minutes to actually travel across the solar system to get to Mars. As a result, traveling, if you were wanted to uh, have uh, any kind of orders to get to Mars in order to watch, uh, in order to move the spirit or opportunity, uh, you couldn't do it in real time. Very simply, uh, if you did it in real time, uh, you can actually take opportunity or spirit and actually drive it over a cliff. And that would not be a good thing. So, uh, yeah. So they actually developed programs to anticipate some of the things that they drove to. They would look off in the distance, try to estimate how far that would be and hope that the wheels would be able to drive over whatever it was that was in between where they were and where they wanted to be. And they developed artificial intelligence in order to do that. And right now, uh, NASA is looking for people to be able to set up some of these programs to be able to anticipate where curiosity has to go. And you can actually join NASA. Uh, there, is, there is a website that you can actually learn how to develop uh, artificial intelligent programs on how to drive the curiosity. And some of the things that curiosity has seen or rather amazing. You can see the tremendously diverse uh, uh, surface of, the, of Mars. Uh, the, the lower right, that's actually a meteorite, or a meteorite on, on Mars anyway. Uh, here are silicon patches, which would indicate a great deal of water on where they were they must have been formed with water. So at some point there was water, free water, flowing water on Mars. And of course, dust devils. And on the lower right, you can see one of the very sophisticated probes designed to measure wind. It was essentially a weight on the end of a string. And if it was blowing in the wind, they could actually estimate how fast the Martian wind was blowing. Extremely sophisticated. They also took pictures of the Martian moons going across the face of the sun as seen from Mars. 
So these were solar eclipses as seen from Mars. And of course, they were able to see uh, objects in the sky. Here we have Jupiter, Venus, and the Earth as seen from Mars. The broken wheel from Spirit uh, definitely set things back. And eventually, Spirit died because of lack of power. Not uh, about 10 years later, opportunity, uh, because of all the dust that was on the solar cells, its batteries could not get their full charge. And the last, the last uh, uh, thing that opportunity actually sent back to Earth was the fact that its battery was low and it's getting dark. A lot of people mourned the death of opportunity at that particular point. The next probe to land on the surface was Phoenix. And Phoenix landed in the northern regions of Mars. It was actually a weather station and a way of taking a look at the surface of the planet. It took pictures of the <clears throat> Martian sun around midnight. And as you can see, just like the Earth in the northern regions, the sun just stayed on the equator and moved across the surface. You can see the clouds moving across the, sur across the sky on Mars. And of course, the surface of Mars uh, would get uh, snow laden as the temperatures would decrease. Uh, the, the scoops on Phoenix would actually dig up some of the Martian surface. And the Martian surface showed that there was actually some type of a moisture on the, on the planet that would collect, that would condense on the colder metal legs of the spacecraft. And this was actually water that would condense and then sublimate right into the air. And you can see on the left here how any kind of ice that was under the surface of the planet would sublimate almost immediately into the Martian air. And again, we have this very sophisticated probe showing that there is almost no air movement, <laughs> at least in the northern region. But if you take a look at the target under it, you can see that there is condensation forming on that piece of metal. And you can see again, dust devils <clears throat> in the distance on the planet. The next probe landed in this alluvial fan. An alluvial fan is actually a place, it's kind of like a delta, where water would actually spread out. So curiosity was uh, was to land in this particular region and look for water. What it found was the fact that the temperatures, first of all, were higher than expected. The midday temperature would be about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. But in the middle of the night, the temperatures would drop to 90 below zero. Here, one of the Martian orbiters actually found Curiosity landing on the surface of the planet. It was actually on its way down. How they timed that, I have no idea, but they did. And one of the things that they found was the fact that 
its landing sequence was bizarre. Uh, I don't think anybody that I knew gave it an even chance to actually get it right, but they did. It actually had a rocket that would slow it down and it had some type of a, uh, a, a, a equipment that would slowly drop the, the curiosity and then it would fly away. It worked and it worked again for insight. So they did something right in order to get curiosity on the surface. Curiosity is about the size of a small car and weighs about the same. And its job was to look for evidence of water. And it found it almost immediately. It found dry riverbeds. It found uh, stream beds that were just like the earth, where pebbles would mark the bottom of, of, the, uh, of the riverbed. And these are actually about the same size. So the Martian history definitely has water there. And it also found lots and lots of anomalies. Like that picture of a statue there up in the upper, upper right. We have Mickey Mouse on the lower left and we have the elephant man on the lower right. And it looks like a pyramid on the upper left there. And of course we have this thing and it actually took the London Sun to actually identify this. It was believed that billions of years ago that the Martian surface, that Mars was more like the Earth. And since something happened, it has evolved into this dry, lifeless planet. Now, what could it have possibly happened to destroy the Martian, the Martian surface? And all you have to do is look at a topographical map of Mars to get a clue. You can see on the right side, there is that huge depression on the south side of that planet. On the left side, you see there is a very, very high mountain coming out of the middle of that planet. It looks as though something hit the planet and then forged its way toward the core of that planet, forcing the core to actually bulge on the other side. As a result of this hit, according to some scientists, it destroyed or actually stopped the core from revolving, actually setting up a point where the dynamic motion of the core stopped. As a result, any kind of magnetic field, any kind of plate tectonic motion was stopped in its tracks. So Mars could not manufacture its own magnetic field like the Earth does. Here on the Earth, we have our magnetic field, which protects us from radiation from the sun. The Martian surface is literally explode, expo, them, exposed to the direct uh, solar wind, which actually at, the, at where Mars happens to be, it moves at about 500 to 800 miles per hour. And these charged particles from the sun will actually erode the surface of Mars, causing it to give up its oxygen, give up its water. Here on the Earth, the magnetic field protects the Earth from, from the uh, solar wind and it will cause the aurora as seen from the Earth. 
again, the Martian aurora is dis, uh, disjuncted, it's uh, disorganized, so there's really nothing on Mars to protect it from the solar wind. So the radiation is, is an environmental constraint uh, for, the, for the creation of life. And the idea is how do you, if we're going to go to Mars, how do you protect people from this radiation? And the, Mar and the answer to that is easily seen on the surface of Mars. There are lava ports. There are lava caves on actually just below the surface of Mars. And if we can get inside of one, and Bigelow Industries is actually in the process of manufacturing habitats that could be put inside of a lava port and then expanded into living quarters. So it's, it's, it's going to happen. It probably won't happen very soon, <laughs> definitely, but it will happen in the future. It'd be, it'd be kind of fun to go to Mars once. There was a point where my daughter once was interviewed and she said that she would like to be the ninth person on Mars. And you know, why, why is that? Well, the first six, actually the first five, everything would work okay. And then you have six, seven, and eight, and the catastrophe would happen. And then they would redefine things, make things ultra safe. So the next one to go to Mars would be ultra safe. Good thinking. Anyway, but Mars' surface, a lot of interesting things on the surface. And you can see that this particular picture was the one that they had first talked about, where they actually saw running water on the surface of Mars. Here is InSight landing on the surface of Mars and then setting up its experiments. InSight was similar to Phoenix in its at least the way it looked, but it was actually designed to do a geodesic study of the planet. It was looking for earthquakes. It was looking actually uh, looking as to see what was going on inside of the planet so they can predict what would happen if they actually dug into the planet. It was also looking for any kind of, <clears throat> of uh, water on the surface or actually below the surface of the planet. So we have three different rovers on the surface of the planet right now. And later on this summer, we will have a fourth rover on its way. Mars 2020 mission, its launch window is between the middle of July and the beginning of August. And it's going to be sent up there and it'll land just right around the, the middle of February in 2021. Its mission will last about a year and it's going to be looking for actual microbial life on the planet. Now, one thing about this particular probe, it's actually going to figure out where it wants to land. It's going to actually have artificial intelligence to be able to look at the surface of the planet and then pick its landing spot. So it's going to take some pictures 
and then land where it needs to. And then its mission is going to be to actually look at different places and see, actually look for microbial life on the surface. About a year ago, this was the action taking place to build this particular rover. Right now, the rover is down at Cape Canaveral and it is probably sitting in its rocket right now. So, we know with the information we have right now, we can probably put off any attack by any Martian and send them back to Mars. And remember, if you ever feel lonely, think about curiosity because it sings happy birthday to itself every year. And its birthday is coming up on August 7th. Breaking news. Wednesday, this past Wednesday, a paper was published talking about the discovery of pre-oxygen on the planet Mars. They found that when they actually investigated the atmosphere of Mars, they found a layer of oxygen, which actually had a green layer across it. And this is similar to what's happening on the Earth. There is a green layer which indicates the presence of oxygen on that planet. That is a sort of a, uh, a ozone layer on the surface of the Earth, and they may have found the, ma the markings of that on Mars. So that's a brand new uh, uh, finding on the planet of Mars. Next week, Pluto, the heart of the Kuiper Belt. Okay, uh, I'm a, 